Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to the seminar. I am a first uh, semester graduate student here at UMBC, and I am very excited to present Dr. Yusuke Kuayama. He is an assistant professor in the School of Public Policy at UMBC and also a fellow at the Resources for the Future in Washington, D.C. He is a principal investigator on a project supported by the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center titled Advancing Integrated Process-Based Modeling of Complex Socio-Environmental Systems. He also currently serves as director of the Consortium for the Valuation of Applications Benefits Linked with Earth Science, or Valuables. Dr. Kuwayama's research focuses on the economics of water resource management. He strives to conduct economic analysis that leads to effective and efficient policy solutions for three major problems related to water quality and scarcity, including inefficient water use in the agricultural sector, trade-offs across economic and ecosystem uses of water, and wastewater management. The methods and techniques Dr. Kuwayama uses to address these issues depend on the specific research question, but usually consist of applied macroeconomic theory, dynamic optimization, applied eco <laughs> Eco, nometrics, and policy analysis. Dr. Kuwayama is particularly interested in interdisciplinary approaches to address questions involving sustainable use and management of coupled human natural systems, especially work that requires uh, modeling human decision-making, hydrologic and ecological processes and the connections between them. Dr. Kuwayama completed his bachelor's degree in economics at Amherst College and his MS and PhD in economics and agricultural and applied economics at University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. So take it away. Thank you, Mackenzie, for that kind introduction. Uh, and thank you to Dr. Miller for inviting me to present in the GS seminar series. Uh, and thank, thank you all for coming today uh, to listen to my talk. Um, let me share my slides. And make this full screen. So in my talk today, I thought I would uh, accomplish three things. Uh, first, um, Mackenzie did provide a nice introduction, um, but I did want to say a little bit about myself. Um, I am uh, faculty here at UMBC, as uh, Mackenzie mentioned, but I'm relatively new. Uh, I started during the pandemic, uh, and it has been a little challenging to meet new people over the last uh, year, year and a half. And so um, I'm hoping that this seminar will be an opportunity for, for me to um, uh, share a little bit about myself and the work that I do, um, uh, but also make this a jumping point for um, uh, getting to know some of you better um, uh, over the rest of the semester uh, and, and the rest of the year uh, as we are uh, seeing increasing opportunities for in-person interaction. And then I thought I would um, summarize two projects that I am involved in. Uh, one is a, a completed project. It's a, it's a project uh, which is uh, already um, yielded a manuscript that is currently um, that we just resubmitted uh, to a journal. Um, and then another project that's very much uh, underway. Um, so that is uh, what I have in mind for today. Uh, so let me start out um, by uh, describing a little bit uh, my background and, and Mackenzie covered a lot of this. So I'll, I'll sort of skip some of this early uh, history here. Um, but um, note that after I received my uh, PhD, at the University of Illinois, I spent nine years at Resources for the Future, which is a think tank uh, in Washington, D.C. And it's a think tank that is focused on economic analysis of uh, environmental and natural resource uh, policy issues. Uh, so during my time there, I um, did uh, a lot of research and publishing, uh, much like one might do at a university, uh, being on, on the faculty at a university. But uh, as a think tank, uh, there was also a lot of scope for uh, policy outreach, uh, particularly to the federal government and agencies in the federal government. And then um, also as a partially soft funded, um, uh, soft money uh, organization, I, I spent quite a bit of time grant writing as well um, during those nine years. And so as of last year, um, I have been uh, 
uh, working as assistant professor in the School of Public Policy um, and uh, teaching courses in quantitative methods and cost benefit analysis so far. Um, and sort of trying to, you know, get my footing um, in terms of uh, potential new collaborations within the university. Um, thinking about focusing on research topics that are perhaps uh, more locally focused um, to, to uh, the Baltimore area as well as Maryland um, and, and more focused in any case than some of the more uh, uh, some of the kinds of questions I've been involved in so far, which are more at the federal level. Um, but that is uh, my history. And in terms of the research topics that I'm currently working on, uh, I can generally bend them into, into four uh, categories. Uh, the first is uh, examining uh, federal and state regulation of ambient water pollution. I'll be talking about that today. Um, policies to promote sustainable water and agriculture, uh, sustainable water use in agriculture, uh, water management approaches for protecting aquatic species habitats. So the second project I'll talk about will relate to these two topics. And then finally, something that um, uh, is actually not about water. Um, it is a program evaluation of earth observing satellites. And I really won't be talking about this today, but uh, I'm happy to share if, if uh, any of you are interested in, in this line of work. Um, in terms of uh, the methods and techniques I used, uh, again, Mackenzie described this from my bio. Um, some of it is very much uh, economic uh, focused, um, but uh, a lot of it also um, is amenable for um, uh, what we might call socio-environmental systems modeling or, or uh, coupled human natural resource um, uh, type problems. Uh, so yeah, very much interested in these kinds of problems that um, require uh, experts from different disciplines to, to be involved. Okay, but enough about me. Um, let's uh, dive into some of this um, uh, substantive work. So the first project that I'm gonna talk about, again, is, is, is a mostly completed project, um, and it seeks to uh, implement a framework that provides a more comprehensive estimate of the value of water quality. And let me motivate this idea of the value of water quality before we get into um, uh, the, the actual analysis. Um, I should definitely not forget to um, note my co-authors on this study, uh, Sheila Olmsted from the LBJ School of Public Affairs at UT Austin and uh, Jamang Zhang, who is currently a postdoc in the business school at uh, the University of Illinois. Uh, it's been a real pleasure working uh, with them on this uh, particular paper. Okay, so speaking of motivation, um, we focus specifically on the effectiveness of the Clean Water Act, uh, which as many of you probably know, is the primary federal law in the United States governing ambient water pollution. And by ambient water pollution, we mean pollution in rivers, lakes, streams, coastal areas, and so on. Uh, so not, not drinking water. Uh, water quality has improved dramatically uh, since the Clean Water Act, and uh, many of you may be familiar with this picture that I have here on this slide of the Cuyahoga River catching on fire, right? Um, this used to be a not so rare occurrence on uh, water bodies in the United States, um, and we don't really have that happen anymore. And so at least along many dimensions, uh, ambient water quality has improved uh, in the United States, and a lot of it can be attributed to the, the Clean Water Act. Um, the Clean Water Act, however, uh, did not, um, the implementation of the Clean Water Act did not come uh, without costs, however, uh, it did require retrofits of wastewater treatment plants, uh, investments in monitoring and enforcement, uh, both at the federal and state level. And so a question that uh, a lot of economists like me try to think about is, you know, what are uh, the benefits? What are the societal benefits of a policy like the Clean Water Act um, to society, given that it does incur costs to society as well? And somewhat disappointingly, uh, existing studies, so studies that have been published in the literature to date, generally suggest that the mar marginal benefits of the Clean Water Act may be equal to at best and often below its marginal costs. So they find that um, the basically the expenditures required by society in order to implement the Clean Water Act have exceeded the benefits to society. And so um, that, you know, is 
I think, a disappointing result, but also perhaps one that uh, requires a bit more um, examination and uh, looking at from different perspectives. And this is what we try to do in this paper. Specifically, we want to think about the multiple kinds of benefits that are associated with cleaner water in rivers, lakes, streams, and estuaries and coastal areas. And uh, note, recognizing that um, these might be, for example, uh, improvements uh, in commercial fishing. Uh, so, especially in coastal areas, cleaner water may lead to improved productivity of fisheries and therefore profits to the fishery sector, uh, improved recreational areas, um, uh, improved recreational benefits, um, improved amenity benefits, um, and sort of aesthetic benefits, right? Um, so just being able to, um, see water that looks cleaner, uh, and not have to smell water that's full of algae, right? Um, that is the category of benefits. And then to the extent that, uh, one might be directly exposed to, uh, poor water quality, there may be some health benefits uh, associated with cleaner water as well. And so this is one of the challenges associated with placing a value on, on water quality improvements is how do we try to get at the benefits that lie along these different dimensions? Um, because people are in some sense interacting with the water in very different ways um, when, when they experience these uh, benefits in these different categories. One way that economists have tried to uh, quantify the benefits of improved water quality is what uh, we call hedonic analysis. And what hedonic analysis does is to estimate the portion of a property sale price. Okay, so think about uh, when you see uh, information on how much a home has sold in your neighborhood, right? That kind of information. Uh, what hedonic analysis tries to do is to take that kind of sale price uh, and break it down into the different characteristics associated with the home, right? So the price of a home can typically depend on things like the number of bedrooms it has, the number of bathrooms, square footage, lot acreage, things like that. But one, arguably, one of the things that may determine, may contribute to the price of a home is uh, the quality of the environmental attributes around the house, right? Uh, and so, in particular, the premise of hedonic analysis is that the price of a home reflects its embodied characteristics, including environmental amenities at or near the home, including water quality at or near the home. Okay, so the basic idea is that you uh, collect a lot of information about homes and uh, the prices at which they've sold. Uh, and one of the attributes that you want to collect about these homes is the environmental amenity near the home. Okay. And so just this simple graphic that I created here, if we consider two homes that are exactly the same, but one is located near a cleaner water body and the other is located near a dirtier water body, then one might expect the sale price for the home that's closer to the cleaner water body to be higher, holding all other attributes of the ho these two houses the same. And so statistically, uh, we should be able to isolate the value, the marginal value, the additional value associated with the cleaner water, right? So this uh, hedonic analysis is, is a statistical approach. It takes in all these data about attributes of homes and tries to isolate the contribution of uh, water quality uh, in um, the price of a home and, and hedonic analysis has been used for other kinds of environmental uh, characteristics of a home, such as surrounding air quality, um, uh, the views, natural views from a home, uh, open space near homes, things like that. But uh, in this particular case, we're focusing on water quality. One issue with the way that hedonic studies have been conducted so far is that they primarily focus on water quality changes very close to homes. And uh, they tend to find that there are very few benefits of improved water quality outside of very small radii around these properties, right? And so, for example, if you take this particular property here, this red dot in this map, you could take a, say, one kilometer uh, circle uh, radius, uh, radius, one kilometer radius circle around that property and take water quality measurements at uh, water quality monitors uh, within that uh, one kilometer radius. Okay, and so these black dots here around this red property uh, indicate locations of uh, water quality monitors. 
And so if you create a data set that joins, for example, average water quality readings at these water quality monitors with this property price, and again, if you have uh, other attributes of this home um, uh, in your data so that you can also isolate the, again, the value of additional bedrooms and bathrooms and square footage and so on, and really then be able to focus on the uh, co contribution of water quality to the home price, uh, home of the price of the home, then we are actually able to place a dollar value on, on the value of water quality, at least as reflected of property values, right? The problem with this approach uh, is that you have to derive benefits, right? If you're the homeowner of this home, you have to derive benefits from these water bodies that are within this one kilometer circle, right? Or, you know, you could choose a larger, you know, radius circle and add more water bodies and associated water quality monitors to the water quality measurement, which you think is relevant to the property of that home. But uh, again, those water bodies need to be the ones from which you're benefiting, right? You actually have to be interacting with these water bodies uh, to a certain extent. And in some regions, and this is gonna be true for the region that we're gonna look, be looking at, uh, Tampa Bay, is that people actually travel quite far away from their home in order to uh, improve, uh, obtain recreational benefits uh, tied to water, okay? And, you know, those of us who live in more urban areas in this region, we, we definitely drive uh, to Chesapeake Bay or um, uh, the Eastern Shore or other water bodies around here to enjoy them, right? Um, and so to the extent that water quality improvements in those farther water bodies actually benefit us, we're not gonna be able to capture that by just taking this approach of uh, including water quality measurements uh, in very small radii around the properties we live in, right? Um, so, so that's the general uh, our hypothesis here that this approach that has been used in previous Adonic studies is uh, somewhat limited in that it really only focuses on water quality in these very local water bodies associated with the properties. So, how are we going to try to tie the the benefits of improved water quality in recreational? Uh, uses uh, when these water bodies aren't close to the properties for which we observe sale prices. What we do is we also bring in a different set of tools known as uh, recreational demand models. What these models do is to estimate the value of water quality for recreation. And the basic premise of this set of tools is that the time and travel cost expenses that people incur to visit a recreational site reflect the recreational value of that site. Okay, so if a recreational site has high value, then we are going to uh, spend a lot of money and time uh, traveling to enjoy that recreational site, right? And if you think about some of the most um, uh, iconic or famous recreational sites, such as certain national parks in the Western United States, right? We, we definitely, you know, many of us have probably, you know, gotten a, a plane ticket, gotten on a plane, uh, you know, hauled our camping gear or had a hotel stay at the destination, right, just to enjoy that recreational site. And so, you know, I think it's it's intuitive to this notion that, you know, you spend more time and more travel expenses um, in order to visit places that yield greater recreational value to you. Okay. And so, again, I, I created a little uh, diagram here where you know, there might be a water body that uh, has some recreational benefits, so people might enjoy fishing or boating in it, um, and people travel to it. Um, but if we collect information on the visitors of these recreational sites and get information on how far they're away they're coming from and how much they've paid to get there, uh, what we might observe, what we hope to observe, is that for water bodies that are relatively cleaner, we will see people driving from farther away in order to recreate at that site and in the process incur higher costs in terms of gasoline um, or wear and tear on their vehicle, right? And so we would like to see a correlation basically between travel cost and uh, the value of uh, recreation at these sites, which have, uh, in this case, improved water quality. Okay, so for this kind of analysis, we need data on recreational visits. Uh, and, and, uh, and data that are 
uh, detailed enough for us to be able to say where people are coming from uh, to visit particular recreational sites. There is an extensive literature that uses this kind of uh, recreational uh, demand model, but it actually doesn't exploit information on housing markets. It only looks at the travel costs associated with these recreational visits, but it doesn't uh, look at the, uh, the price of properties associated with uh, the, the, the visitors. So what we're gonna do is to sort of join, basically join hedonic analysis, which is what I described earlier up here and recreational um, demand modeling uh, using a two-step uh, econometric framework. In terms of context, we are focused on Tampa Bay. Uh, Tampa Bay was a good region to look at, uh, first of all, because this uh, study uh, is, was tied uh, to an older project uh, associated with an EPA grant that um, uh, examined opportunities for uh, innovations in nutrient management in the Tampa Bay area. So locationally, that's one that's one reason why locationally we are focused in this region. But it is also an area that uh, has experienced poor ambient water quality in the past, and um, uh, but has improved significantly over time, as as we'll see. And and you know the kinds of you know, pollution uh, outcomes that we see in this area are, are, are ones that I've you know, provided here in terms of pictures. I mean, it's, it's significant enough to seriously diminish your, you know, recreational benefits of um, boating or fishing in this kind of water, right? Um, so uh, it, it's a good context to look at for that reason as well, that it, there, there have been meaningful improvements in water quality. Um, over the time period for which we have data uh, on recreational activities and housing markets uh, in this region. Okay, so uh, I'm happy to share the, the, the manuscript for anyone who's interested in the details um, and it's full of equations and tables and things like that. But um, I think this visual summary is probably the best for now to uh, give you a sense of how exactly this analysis works. So as I said, one of the components of this approach is to use this recreational demand model, and it's actually gonna be the first stage of our analysis here. And in particular, we're going to take information on water quality in regional recreational waters in the Tampa Bay region, and then also from survey data uh, on, from recreators, estimate the travel costs that they incur to visit recreational sites that have certain levels of water quality and then use this model to predict uh, their decisions to go on a fishing trip. So we're gonna focus specifically on, on uh, recreational anglers here uh, in this analysis. Um, and, and one of the limitations of our study actually is that we don't capture the benefits associated with other kinds of recreation uh, in, in the recreational waters in Tampa Bay, but this is what we have um, data for. Okay. so. Uh, the basic idea here is that, um, again, we are looking at sort of this, this trade-off, right? So uh, a recreational site with cleaner, wa better water quality, uh, I would like to visit that more because uh, it, it yields greater benefits to me uh, from a recreational perspective, but it's also going to cost me more, right? So you can almost think of this as, as, as have, if you have that data, then you can come up with this kind of ratio of cost of enjoying this recreational area um, per unit of uh, water quality improvement, right? That's the basic idea behind the recreational demand model. And it's a predictive model in that uh, it then generates a recreational index. And, and we do this for each zip code in the Tampa Bay region. And okay? so uh, you can think about the output of this recreational demand model as being a recreational index tied to water quality for each zip code in Tampa Bay. And then that serves as an input into the second stage uh, of this approach, which is the hedonic modeling involving the property prices. So here we take the recreational index as one independent variable and combine it with water quality in very local water bodies, okay? Uh, because those are the water bodies that can also influence the price of a property, in particular, if a property is very close to, to, a, to a, a water body, right? Um, so again, this is gonna be a statistical framework here where we try to explain property prices as a function of water quality in very local water bodies. And then this recreational index, which 
embodies the value of water quality in the regional recreational waters that may be quite a bit farther from this property than these very local water bodies. And so this is how we try to get both aspects uh, tied to the property prices, right? So we, we hypothesize that the property prices are influenced by water quality changes in these very local water bodies, but also by regional recreational water quality through fishing trips. Okay, and we're able to, again, examine the contribution of that on property prices because we're including this recreational index as, as a variable in this model. Okay. All right. Ultimately, what we get out of this two-stage model is value of improvements that can, of water quality improvements that can be separated into one of improvements in very local water bodies and then those in regional recreational waters. And in particular, you know, I want to highlight that the hedonic analyses that have been conducted to date and the kinds of analyses that, as I mentioned in the motivation part of this uh, talk, um, that tend to find fairly low benefits relative to costs associated with the Clean Water Act, those are tied to these very local water bodies and they exclude the benefits associated with these regional recreational waters. And what our framework does is to bring those regional recreational waters in uh, in order to examine whether property prices are influenced by changes in those regional water quality changes in those regional waters as well. Okay, just to give you a sense of where the data came from, um, and this was uh, involved a lot of work uh, in particular by Jamang. Um, the, we have repeat sales data for single family homes from property appraisers offices in three counties in the Tampa Bay area representing uh, over 300,000 repeat sales. And, and I, I say repeat sales here because what we focused on are data from homes that have been sold at least twice between the uh, time period that we looked at. Um, and the reason why that is helpful for us from a statistical perspective is that then it basically gives us a panel data set, right? We are able to observe the same house that has sold multiple times during the time period of analysis. And we can look at how water quality has changed for that home. Um, but because we're able to observe the same home being sold twice, we can control for attributes of the home that contribute to the price that we don't even observe, right? So we can get some basic information about these homes, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, and so on. But there may be many attributes of these homes that we can't observe uh, as a statistician. And what using repeat sales allows us to do is to basically include a dummy variable for every single home. And therefore that dummy variable captures all of the unobserved characteristics of these homes that do not vary over time. And therefore we can look at specifically the contribution of water quality changes associated with the home, both locally and regionally. Again, we need some information on the recreational uh, behavior of individuals in this region, and we do that through the Marine Recreational Information Program uh, survey uh, by NOAA, which includes information such as the date in which the interview was, take, was done, the angler's residential zip code. Um, this survey has been collected for 85 fishing lo site locations in the Tampa Bay area. And there are other attributes uh, of, the, of these trips that are included in this information. And then we need the water quality data, right? That's, that's ultimately what we tie to both the properties as well as these recreational um, sites, uh, the information for which we have um, through this uh, NOAA survey. So we get that through EPA's um, store it um, uh, retrieval system. And we also pair it with some seagrass abundance uh, information from the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. Uh, seagrass abundance actually is a bit of a tricky variable to think about from a recreational uh, fishing perspective because uh, while it tends to be a good indicator of uh, ecological um, status uh, of a water body, it, it actually can often be a nuisance for, um, for anglers, uh, especially those who, um, who use boats to, to get out to to their fishing site. And so uh, from a recreational benefits perspective, we, we see that the contribution of seagrass abundance is actually quite mixed. Anyway, uh, let me get to the results. Um, so bottom line, uh, we see a 10% increase in dissolved oxygen. That is the measure of water quality that uh, we choose here in this study. Um, 
and it is a, a commonly used uh, metric for water quality in many of these non-market valuation studies. Um, but yes, more DO is good. Um, and so 10% uh, increase over this time period. Um, uh, it, we've been associated, we, we've been able to associate that improvement in water quality uh, using our two-stage framework to a 0.233% increase in mean property prices in this region and a 42 cent increase in this recreational index that is created by the first stage of the uh, this two-stage process. And so what that ends up translating to when we look at mean property values in this area is that the household's marginal willingness to pay for improvements in local uh, improvements in local dissolved oxygen, so dissolved oxygen levels in local water bodies for this 10% increase of, uh, observed during this period is about $454 per property. And at the regional level, about $1,000 per property. So on a per property basis, you can think about the value of this 10% increase in dissolved oxygen that has been experienced in the Tampa Bay region on average to be associated with these kinds of price premiums in homes. Okay? And what's particularly striking about this result, we think, is that the, recreate, the regional contributions through recreational fishing are almost double those of just looking at improvements in water quality and water bodies very close to these homes. And so uh, one of the implications of our study is that a lot of these existing studies, earlier studies that focused only on local dissolved oxygen and other water quality measures and associating them with property sale prices uh, are missing out on a big chunk of the benefits of water quality and actually mapping out where people are going uh, outside of these small radii around these properties to enjoy uh, cleaner water uh, can make a big difference in attributing um, uh, prices, uh, uh, increases in property prices to water quality. Scaling this up, um, there are different ways in which we might scale up this per property estimate. Uh, we could do it for just the sample households, so the households for which we have information. Uh, in those three counties that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we could do all repeat sales in the region uh, for which we also don't have data. Um, so I guess the, the, the thing to point out here is that we have about 14,000 um, households in the sample. Um, but if we look at all repeat sales, that grows to 170,000. And then if we look at the Tampa Bay metro area, there are roughly about 800,000 uh, homes. Okay, so you could sort of extrapolate at different levels just to your sample, something a little bigger than your sample, and then sort of assuming that the sample, the me whole metro area is representative of the sample. And the numbers that we get um, are in this table, but the most important ones are that for this 10% increase in dissolved oxygen observed from 1998 to 2014, the range of estimates is admittedly pretty wide, uh, 20 million to uh, over a billion. Okay, and that sort of depends on your assumptions about what proportion of the housing market in this region has experienced um, these improvements, uh, has have capitalized these um, improvements in water quality. Now, so those are the benefits. What were the costs of obtaining the 10% increase in dissolved oxygen? The Tampa Bay Estuary Program estimates provides estimates, from not all, roughly half of projects implemented during this time period. Um, that are associated with improvements in water quality in this region, and the, those costs total 585 million. So, you know, this range of benefits that we find sort of, you know, it, it, this is definitely right in the middle, uh, but there's certainly an argument to be made that you really need to include these recreational benefits in order to get an estimate that actually exceeds the cost um, associated with uh, improving water quality in this region. Okay. So, um, in conclusion, uh, Tampa Bay, uh, which is a major coastal city, has experienced significant recovery from eutrophication and other issues associated with nutrient pollution over several decades. And the house, we find that the housing market has capitalized those water quality gains. Um, and this is done through both uh, local amenity values, through improvements in very local water quality to properties, as well as these regional recreational benefits. And this leads us to conclude the recreational benefits of water quality improvements are likely underrepresented in prior hedonic studies, uh, and they appear to be larger than these uh, very local benefits. Uh, and then um, 
in this case, the benefits of reducing nutrient pollution may exceed the costs. And so, you know, the Clean Water Act uh, is is likely to be have been a cost effective uh, policy. Uh, and at smaller scales, um, there may be many benefits that we should be capturing through more detailed analysis of different categories of benefits associated with uh, water quality improvements. Okay, um, so that was that first project. It's sort of you know it's got result. It has results and everything. <laughs> um, the second project is very much an ongoing project, and um, uh, it's uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about what uh, inspires it. What are some uh, approaches that we are trying to take? Um, and certainly would be really interested in um, uh, talking to anybody who's um, working on similar issues, uh, perhaps in, in, in different regions. But uh, the specific uh, analysis that I'll talk about today is this question of the socioeconomic trade-offs associated with water management in river basins where uh, surface water and groundwater may disconnect. And I'll um, talk about that in a little bit. Um, I will mention that this, the particular analysis that I'm about to talk about is part of a broader set of analyses that uh, I have been working on with uh, an amazing group of researchers uh, in a working group that is supported by the National Socio Environmental Synthesis Center, SYSINC, which uh, many of you are familiar with. It's, it's sort of a, a locally based um, synthesis center. Um, and uh, in this particular working group, uh, we have uh, a lot of economists, ecologists, and hydrologists. And, and the general goal of this working group is to think about ways in which we can incorporate those three disciplines, economics, hydrology, and ecology, to study problems in which there are socioeconomic trade-offs uh, in, in uses of water. And in particular, those that involve some sort of uh, ecological benefit, like uh, fish population or fish habitat. Um, and, you know, the, the trade off of maintaining uh, the status of those um, ecological outcomes being things like water use and irrigation or, or residential use or industrial use, things that may um, lead to uh, consumptive uses of water that diminish um, water available for these um, ecosystem uh, uses. Um, so yeah, uh, a lot of people involved in this, um, but uh, and then a number of different research questions we are addressing. A lot of the research questions we try to address from what we've been calling a uh, appropriate complexity modeling approach. Um, and what our hypothesis there in, in taking that approach is that in particular for questions that involve systems, human systems and natural systems that exhibit complexities like uh, thresholds, um, discontinuities, uh, nonlinearities, uh, uncertainties and, and deep uncertainties in particular, non-stationary processes. These, at least at an initial level, are best examined using a relatively parsimonious set of models derived from uh, these three disciplines, from economics, from hydrology, from ecology. And so instead of taking the most complicated and detailed model that economists have built and the most complicated detailed model that hydrologists have built and the ones that ecologists have built and you know, uh, trying to get them all to work e with each other, uh, a, a good initial uh, exploration from a policy perspective might be one where we take a more parsimonious approach, in particular when there are these complexities involved in these systems such as thresholds and non-stationary processes. Uh, but that's sort of the general approach of the working group. And in this particular study, we are looking at this issue of uh, connected surface water and groundwater, which is a problem that I examined in my dissertation over 10 years ago. Um, and I'm sort of now finally coming back to um, after being involved in uh, other different um, research questions uh, in between. Uh, but um, the general uh, issue here, uh, resource issue here, is that um, when there is a groundwater extraction from an aquifer, if this extraction takes place close to a stream, uh, certain uh, rates of extraction may lead to changes in gradients in the aquifer where uh, water starts being um, uh, uh, abstracted, I guess, uh, from other parts of the aquifer, and in particular, uh, 
uh, directly from the stream eventually if, if, if pumping is is um, significant enough relative to the rate of uh, replenishment in these water bodies, right? And so we, uh, economists in particular, have thought about groundwater and surface water as, as sort of different resources that don't interact, but there are many situations in which they do interact. Um, um, I'm very interested in these kinds of systems. One thing that the hydrologists in our group had pointed out is that um, there is this in addition to the connection between groundwater and surface water there, in some contexts, uh, there's this discontinuity or this threshold um, where at some point, if uh, the aquifer is depleted um, significantly, it may lead to uh, a regime in which the groundwater is completely disconnected from the surface water. And that influences the infiltration rate in an interesting way. So the relationship between uh, difference in head and infiltration rate, you know, has, has a sort of a linear relationship when the two systems are connected, but then when they're disconnected, there's sort of this maximum infiltration rate that uh, persists uh, regardless of the distance between the aquifer and the, and the, and the stream bed. Okay. And so, um, uh, we are, we're interested in understanding what the socioeconomic trade-offs might be when you account for the fact that groundwater surface water connections may exhibit this kind of, um, nonlinearity. And, and some may even think about it as a threshold where, where you might sort of get stuck in this regime of disconnection. The particular socioeconomic trade-off we look at is a trade-off between, uh, groundwater pumping for agricultural irrigation and the benefits that would be associated with not pumping that groundwater and leaving it in the stream, right? Because because these two systems are connected in the context that we're looking at, um, and uh, leaving it in the stream would prevent um, problems like this, where uh, fish habitat um, is um, deteriorates. This is not an esoteric environmental problem. Um, Simulations show that stream flow declines of 10 to 50 percent um, in response to groundwater pumping are uh, are expected in the Western United States, and, and in fact, this problem is global. This linkage between environmental flows um, that um, are being reached uh, in many parts of the world, and uh, the overlap of that with uh, depletion of groundwater supplies. So this is. Um, uh, uh, a big problem and, you know, that serves as uh, more motivation for the study. All right. I'm going to start moving a little faster because I do want to leave time for questions at the end. So what we did was again, take this, uh, what we've been calling an appropriate complexity modeling approach and try to, um, come up with some, uh, systems in that are sort of human systems and ecological systems and hydrologic systems and kind of bin them together and try to describe the relationships and variables associated with these systems in a fairly parsimonious way. And in particular, the hydrologists in the group developed what we have been calling a three bucket model, where one bucket is the river stage. So this is you know, a very simplified model with one river and then one portion of the aquifer that lies right below the river and then a linked alluvial aquifer from which water is pumped in order to uh, irrigate crops and, and therefore lead to agricultural profits, right? And on the other end uh, of the model, the river stage influences uh, fish population, which uh, we care about um, because the fish may be commercially valuable or we care about the fish because uh, they're uh, important for recreational fishing or, or they're an endangered species. There's some sort of societal value associated with them. And so, uh, we choose functions that um, uh, model the relationships between changes in, for example, uh, river stage and um, aquifer levels and the underlying uh, aquifer and um, lateral flows in the aquifer and um, other um, processes. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the details, but um, what uh, we can do is come up with a system of ordinary, ordinary differential equations, which we can then start uh, to a certain extent, analyzing um, analytically, so you know, paper and pencil, so to speak, um, but also start doing some simulations. Um, so that this was just the the, the system of uh, differential equations describing um, 
states and flows within the three buckets in the hydrologic system, but we also have uh, an ecological submodel that, um, again, tries to simplify things to the bare minimum needed to understand this, the key question, which is, you know, what is this, the role of this sort of threshold connection, disconnection threshold between groundwater and surface water on the socioeconomic trade-offs. And so uh, we take uh, a, a fish population function uh, that uh, takes in, you know, fairly aggregate statistics associated with flow and variability in flow and tie that to population function, uh, population metrics. And then we take a super simple uh, economic model that's just a quadratic function. The, the profits are a quadratic function of groundwater pumping. This is one part where we've actually made quite a bit of progress on since um, these uh, results that I'm about to present. Okay, so we run a bunch of simulations and we've started out fairly simple using constant pumping rates, a six month time horizon for the pumping, uh, using historical variability to represent river flow uh, and therefore ecological outcomes in the in the in the river, um, and then the equilibrium fish population tied to average river flow over the simulation. And you know as we, these results you know are key, are changing, but the general you know a couple of key points here. So this is what we call a trade off curve. Okay, so we're looking at agricultural profit, so more agricultural profit is you know, higher up on the y-axis, and then fish adult population in equilibrium on the x-axis here. So the farther out we go on the x-axis, we have more fish, right? And because water is a constraining factor here that contributes to both, there's sort of gonna be this trade-off where we're gonna have a negative curve on this space. So if we wanna want more of one thing, we're gonna have to get less of the other, okay? But when we account for the fact that these systems can be connected or disconnected, we lead to we have these very interesting situations where um, you know you can derive regions of uh, combinations of agricultural profit and fish population that drive the system toward reconnection or keep the system disconnected if you are already in a disconnected state. But if you're in a connected state, there's regions where you actually then drive toward disconnection or you keep the system connected. Okay. Um, and so you can actually be on these trade-off curves depending on which regime you're in. And, and obviously this, this trade-off curve here in the connected regime is better uh, in the sense that it provides both more fish and more uh, agricultural profit than here, right? But, you know, there's always this temptation of getting into these zones where a uh, system, a connected system is driven toward disconnection or a connected system is uh, maintained as disconnected, right? Um, sort of once you are in one regime, then it's sort of, you, you, you're, you're tempted to move into these regions where you get more of both, uh, or in this particular case, agriculture gets more, right? Um, and uh, that is counterproductive in the sense that if, for example, you are in that disconnected state, you actually might wanna incur some temporary pain in the form of very low agricultural profit in order to move toward a reconnected system that then gives you more fish and more agricultural profit at the same time, right? So that's the kind of interesting thing that comes out uh, from, from this kind of analysis. And we're you know, still playing around with these models quite a bit. I'm just gonna skip this graph because it basically conveys the same information in a different um, two-dimensional space. Uh, there are a number of things that we're interested in looking at for this problem, uh, in particular, looking at uncertainty in river flow and how that affects the trade-off, um, river flow or aquifer recharge, um, risk aversion over agricultural profits. Um, so instead of just looking at agricultural profits, what if we want to smooth these out over time? Um, pumping rates that are not constant, but are actually chosen as a function of the water levels in the aquifer, which seems like an important thing to do. And we've been working on that as well. Um, periodic conditions for river inflow or irrigation demand. So if irrigation demand or river inflow varies over the year, then, you know, how do we make that compatible with this model? Um, this is, relates to endogenously chosen pumping rates, but how do you deal with groundwater pumping and well drilling costs? So it, it's not free to get the water out of the aquifer. Uh, and there may be some interesting socioeconomic trade-offs there, uh, which actually help us get toward a regime when which the uh, systems are connected as opposed to disconnected. And then uh, uh, in particular out West, there's this interesting question of the of perennial costs and the uh, perennial crops and these fixed costs. And once you've 
sunk a lot of costs into planting an almond grove, then you know, how does that affect your decision of um, pumping from an aquifer and how might it lead to different outcomes in uh, connected or disconnected uh, river aquifer systems like these? Okay, so hopefully I've left enough time for questions. Um, in any case, happy to uh, connect, as I was saying earlier, uh, here's my email address and I sporadically uh, post things on Twitter. Um, thank you very much and I will stop sharing now. Thanks, uh, Yusuke. Um, I want to uh, invite people to submit questions. We have uh, a little bit of time left. And what we'll do is ask you to type a question into the chat, and uh, we'll ask you to unmute and ask your question live um, once that's there. So obviously, we heard about a couple of different projects. And um, I'm actually going to ask a question to get started um, since they're not posted yet. I forgot to mention this before. So in your model, actually, wait, I need to manipulate something here. Let's see how I do this. Move to stage. Okay, there. Um, so um, another constraint that you mentioned uh, in the introduction of your second part was that had to do with non-stationary. And clearly we know that, particularly in examples you're looking at in the West, um, there's a considerable concern about the impact of climate change on the availability of this water, um, which I imagine could drive the whole system towards disconnection much faster than what might be assumed based on the way the model is set up. Was that a consideration in terms of how you're doing this work? Right. Um, so we have a separate paper that is focusing specifically on um, the non-stationary aspects, and uh, we aren't at the point where we can actually say anything directly about outcomes or you know policy recommendations even so will the system be driven to disconnection more quickly uh, we aren't sure yet we're still sort of grappling with what kinds of algorithms we use to deal with uh, a context where society is trying to optimize over outcomes that are influenced by a non-stationary process right and uh, and in particular, does it no longer make sense to think about um, uh, the designing policies and, and water management um, uh, strategies that sort of maximize the expected value of these outcomes, right? Just sort of the mean expected value going into the future, right? Um, uh, should uh, we be thinking about, um, uh, you know, what? what uh, what we've been calling, um, you know, robust decision making, um, or uh, you know, scenario analysis. These kinds of tools that have been uh, proposed to to look at these kinds of um, uh, settings where there's non-stationarity and then perhaps some uncertainty regarding the parameters of the stochastic process. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm afraid I can't say uh, what we've, what we found about the the likelihood of uh, connections or disconnections. Um, uh, but yeah, we're working on it and it's, it's certainly a, a question that interests, uh, a lot of us in the working group. Thanks. So we have to have a question from Ethan Cruikshank. Ethan, you want to unmute and answer your question? Hi, thank you. Yeah, I was wondering, um, how did you control for changes in housing prices that were unrelated to, uh, the changes in amenities, sort of like, um, population growth or just general economic growth? Right. Um, so yeah, we. So this is a great question, and it's it's you know definitely the question that we got kind of grilled on by the reviewers when we submitted this to the journal uh, the first time. Um, and yeah, it's it's basically the how credible is uh, our claim that we've isolated the effect on property prices uh, specifically to water quality, right? And in particular, the the concern is that uh, there may have been something going on in this region that's influencing uh home prices that is correlated with water quality right so it's sort of going up and down with water quality at the same time that we aren't controlling for that we don't have data for right that, that would be the uh lead to the uh, misattribution of uh the value of the property home to water quality and so we did a few things one again is this uh, question of um uh, this uh, issue of the repeat sales so we we only used uh, uh properties for which we could observe uh, at least two sales. 
Uh, and what that allows us is again, to use dummy variables basically for every single uh, property. And so control for uh, as attributes of those properties that don't change uh, over time. In terms of things like economic conditions, uh, recreational preferences of the population, things like that, um, uh, all we could do was to put in some uh, time trends, uh, time trend variables in our regressions and in, in the statistical um, uh, the, the equations that we estimated, um, and that should control for things that um, you know may have uh, changed over time, uh, but at least sort of change for all properties at the same time. Okay, thanks. Um, I don't see any more questions right at the moment. We're all, oh wait, there is one from Maria Fernando Del Carpio. Maria, what care to unmute and ask a question? Yes, hi, Jessica. Thank you for, for the presentation. This was very interesting. Um, in, in your project one, I was wondering, like the recreational benefits that you show are driven from data from three counties, right? And mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm curious about how you compare them to the cost of the federal policy in general, and also how can you elucidate what part of the costs are related to um, surface water? Uh, so surface water, as opposed to, um, uh, are supposed to groundwater as opposed to mm. other. Okay. Or, yep. Right. Um, so, right. The, the housing price information we have, uh, as well as the recreational, um, trip information is, is limited to these 3 counties. Um, and we compared the estimated benefits to costs of projects that were implemented in those three counties. Um, so, yeah, all we can say really is the, the comparison between costs and benefits within the three counties. And we don't actually estimate uh, anything for that applies, you know, broadly to the Clean Water Act. Um, you know, our what, what we point out is that this may have implications for estimates of the benefits of the Clean Water Act moving forward. Um, uh, yeah, and in terms of uh, improvements in surface water versus groundwater, I mean, it's possible. I don't know for sure. Uh, Sheila looked at the the projects the, for which we uh, added up the costs. I imagine some of those are projects that um, influence uh, uh, emissions into groundwater first, and then uh, and then through um, uh, transport into surface water. Um, the although then you know there's then going back to the question of the Clean Water Act, the Clean Water Act doesn't regulate um, pollution and groundwater, although that's that's a bit of a Supreme Court issue right now, <laughs> really interesting one. Uh, at one point is, is, uh, is, is our two systems connected. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, we are at time. So I think we're going to stop uh, the recording and thank everybody for attending. Uh, really interesting. There's, I could think a whole another dozen questions that would be interesting to ask, but we don't have time to cover them now, but, uh, you saw uh, his uh, email address, um, and um, we can actually let me post it one more time. And I'm going to stop the recording, but well, I'll post it one more time, and I'll stop the recording. Give me the email address again. Oh, I, I can type it in too here. Go ahead and type it in. Um, so, if anybody has more questions, you know uh, where to reach Yusuke, and um, he would be more than happy to discuss both the work he's done and also potential collaboration opportunities. So, thanks and. Uh, I'll just say welcome to UMBC, given that this is your, as you've told me, it's your, this is your first semester physically on campus, even though you've joined the faculty last year. So we're very happy to have a chance to meet you and look forward to uh, continuing uh, discussions in the future. I'm going to turn off the recording now.